I'm Dr. Alan Rappaport, and I'm here at the 29th meeting of the Headache Cooperative of New England in beautiful, cold, and very snowy Stowe, Vermont. And I have with me Dr. Peter McAllister, uh, whose practice is in Stamford, Connecticut. And he gave a fantastic talk yesterday summarizing where we stand with the monoclonal antibodies to CGRP and to the receptor and how many are, have been used and uh, what the good news is, what some of the possible side effects are. And I've asked Peter to share with you some of the top lines from his talk. And he's going to give us his academic affiliation and the name of his center. All right, well, thank you, Alan. I'm Peter McAllister. I'm the medical director of the New England Institute for Neurology and Headache in Stanford, as Alan said, and also have academic appointments at Yale and Quinnipiac Universities. So I've been involved as an investigator on the CGRP monoclonal antibodies since their inception from phase two and into phase three studies. So I've had a lot of experience before they even came out on the market. Um, we are now in a new era in headache medicine for the last 10 months. Uh, the world has changed and we call this the CGRP monoclonal antibody era because things have changed in our practice. Uh, what I said in the talk is that we are very comforted with the very large uh, double-blind placebo-controlled studies from the four different companies and the four different compounds. There were almost 10,000 patients studied in the phase two and phase three studies. We found very good outcomes as far as reduction in monthly migraine days, reduction in uh, the uh, disability on patient reported outcomes. We found drops in 50% uh, responder rates. There were some of the so-called super responders at 75% or greater or 100% reduction in headaches. Uh, so it's all very exciting. Um, we need to temper that though. We need to know that there are unknowns still in this post-CGRP era. Uh, unknown, for example, is what happens long term. And this has come up again and again. We are comforted that we have now one year, three year, and five year data, um, but the sample size is small. If you look at the total number of folks post marketing since they were approved uh, fremonezumab, galcanezumab, and arenumab, we have probably in the ballpark of over 200,000 patients who have received a monoclonal antibody uh, since launch. And so far, there's been nothing that makes us stop cold in our tracks and say something's wrong here. That's very comforting. Um, but we need to always remember that these are early days and that studies are a little bit artificial. We take predominantly healthy people, right, and we put them in studies. If they've got significant heart disease, significant psychiatric comorbidities, etc., we tend not to put them in. We often exclude people with large body mass index, and we certainly exclude people over a certain age. 60 or 65 is pretty common. So the questions are, what happens when we use this in a larger group of people who were not quite the folks that would have fit in our study? And you hear sort of murmurings, and of course, we are in the social media era. And uh, patients blog, and doctors blog, and there are email listservs and things like that. So I presented some of the perhaps controversies, uh, whether they're real or not, um, that I've been hearing uh, over the last 10 months or so. Uh, we wonder about CGRP and its effect on the fetus. And we don't know that yet. And I'm, I don't know about you, I'm very cautious in my patients who are looking to start a family. I am too. Yeah, and I think we should continue to be that way until we have a large um, pregnancy registry database so we can draw some conclusions. I mean, I think most people realize this, but once a person has a shot, it takes five months before that drug's out of the body. So we really do have to counsel our women of childbearing potential. And along the same lines of this five months to get it completely out of the body, we have no guidance on switching from one monoclonal antibody to another. Let's say somebody is on a particular, say, a receptor binder, and either for lack of efficacy or side effects, we decide to switch them over to a ligand uh, blocker. Do we switch in one month? Do we switch after five half-lives or five months? I bet we do the same thing. 
Well, I think we have some guidance from the use of monoclonals in other disease states, such as rheumatoid arthritis and plaque psoriasis, et cetera. I think that if it's just an efficacy issue, um, I make a direct switch in the next month. Right. If it's a minor side effect, I make the switch in a month. And if it's a major or a concerning side effect, I will let it wash out before I put them on a new one. Um, there are also some other things we wonder about. So CGRP is ubiquitous in the body. We wonder about the effect on the gut. In the gut is the predominantly beta isoform of CGRP. And the enteric gut, the nervous system, is heavily innervated with CGRP uh, and CGRP receptors. Now, in the studies across the four compounds, only one, arenumab, had a slight signal for constipation only in the high dose. It was about 3% of folks at the 140 milligrams. What we hear, and this is all anecdotal, is that may be a bit higher um, outside of studies and in the post-marketing world when people are getting these. And so I went back and looked at a database from the FDA. It's called the FDA MedWatch Adverse Event Reporting System. And uh, found some interesting things. For example, if we take a Renamab, with 7,000 reports. Now, patients, consumers, doctors, anyone can report anything to the FDA MedWatch uh, website. It's not cause and effect necessarily, it's just something that happened. If you look at constipation, it was reported about 11% of the complaints or reports had to do with constipation. But because I'm not convinced that the receptor ligand blocker is specific for constipation, I looked up the other two, galcanezumab and fremenezumab, and they also reported constipation at about 3.5%. So while constipation may be a little higher outside the studies, it seems to me it's in the ballpark of either single digits or perhaps 10%, but time is going to tell that as well. We then look at some theoretical risks. Now remember, we're very comforted by the phase two and phase three studies, and if you pool that data and take a look at it, there was no one specific safety signal that came out at all. Very reassuring. But what about things like angiogenesis? CGRP plays a role in that. Are we gonna have blood vessels sprouting up? Are we gonna have blockage of that? What about um, uh, stroke and uh, heart attack? So we did not see a, a signal in the studies, but we did not include folks who are either older or had multiple stroke or heart uh, risk factors. So what happens to them? Uh, so far, there have been a fleeting number of reports to this FDA MedWatch. Again, cause and effect can't be established. Fortunately, it's quite low. Uh, we also wonder about platelet aggregation, um, aggregation inhibition because CGRP pay, plays a role. And we wonder about the effects on bone growth and healing if one were to fracture a bone because CGRP, again, plays a role in that. I think, and it's not been proved, that because it's a neuropeptide, it comes on, it goes off very quickly, we have a number of them, I think there may be a redundant system that if it, one is blocked partially, another kind of comes to take its place, it still remains to be seen. That's a very good summary of what you said. I have just a couple of questions. I'm very interested in medication overuse syndrome. What have you seen uh, in your patients with medication overuse that you put on one of these antibodies and don't say anything about reducing your medication? Right. So I think that um, we have some data from the studies to suggest that upwards of 40% of folks, for example, in the chronic migraine studies, had medication overuse. And they did just as well as those who did not have medication overuse, with the caveats that we excluded folks using a lot of narcotics and a lot of betalbital. Um, in my practice, I have used this drug uh, successfully in people with medication overuse. Instead of the old teaching that we must detox them off and then, and then add a, a bridging and then a preventive, I think we could put them on a CGRP drug, and if they are going to be a responder, um, they will naturally decrease medication use and resolve that condition. Has that been your experience? Exactly the same, but I still believe in talking to them and saying, look, we do want you to reduce this. This injection probably will help that, and it will happen naturally, but your job is to reduce it. Exactly.
And the last question I would ask you is, which is the best one of the three that are out? <laughs> uh, the best one is the one that works for that individual patient. And I think that we, it's, this is where clinical medicine takes over from the science. And we get to use our best judgment as clinicians for that particular patient. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.